Hey, it's Jag. You're probably listening to this episode of the podcast because you know the person I'm about to interview. I get it. We all do it. But with Banquet mere weeks away, I'd encourage you, after you listen to this episode, to go check out an interview with somebody you don't know. We are one big family, after all, and you never know what professional and personal connections you may have with other JPZ relatives. All of our interviews will be published before you get to Syracuse, so get to know an alum you haven't met. And now, enjoy this episode of WJPZ at 50. For half a century, WJPZ Syracuse has been the greatest media classroom on the planet. We've trained students from the 1970s to the 2020s on how to run a professional radio station. But the lessons learned and relationships formed go far beyond studios and transmitters. Taking a look back through the eyes of those who experienced it. This is WJPZ at 50. Welcome to WJPZ at 50. I am John Jagay. Today's guest has been on my bucket list since we started the podcast. He is a legend in Atlanta radio. He is a WJPZ Hall of Famer. And he's been described by classmates as someone who saved the radio station after the original founding fathers. From the class of 1979, Mr. Mike Roberts, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's very kind of you. There's so much to cover here with you. You are on the Mount Rushmore of WJPZ. (laughs) And so much to talk about in your amazing career since. But we'll start at the beginning. How did you find out about Syracuse? And then how did you come to the radio station? I actually applied for about four or five schools, mm-hmm. Syracuse being the, the main one I wanted to go to. Fortunately, I got accepted at all of them. So I uh, chose Syracuse uh, because I'd heard about the mass communications course. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the main reason why I, Syracuse was on my list. I, I can't remember how I'd heard about WJPZ as well. I'm this kid who had a radio station at in, in his high school. I had a radio station in my house that I built. And so the fact that Syracuse had not only the traditional, you know, FM, you know, I think at the time it was a, a hybrid of jazz and all kinds of other. Yeah, W-A-E-R. Yeah. W-A-E-R. Yeah. But WJPZ was doing top 40. Um, I'm this kid who grew up listening to WKBW in Buffalo, CKLW in Detroit, mm-hmm. uh, ABC, and LS. So, you know, that was in my wheelhouse, the whole idea of being at a top 40 station. So that's what was one of the main things that drew me to Syracuse. We had a, a security guard at the high school who told me either he knew somebody in Syracuse or had been to Syracuse a number of times, and he volunteered to drive me to Syracuse to visit. Oh, wow. During the summer before I was supposed to start there. Mm -hmm. And and my mission was to find the radio station where we got. (laughs) I don't think we found it because I think the station actually, it was relatively new at the time. I think it was summertime, so the campus was kind of of quiet Mm -hmm. and nobody was there. But I knew it was at Spectrum Records. That's all I knew. Okay. (laughs) And so I was just excited to be there. My grandfather always also lived in Syracuse at the time. Okay. So my math is right. So you graduated in 79. So this would have been 75 that you got there. And the, yes, it was 75. And the radio station is in its infancy on the AM dial, just, you know, duct tape and bubble gum in the Spectrum Records building. So fall comes, you get to campus, and then you, I imagine you found it very quickly after getting there for class. Yes. I found the radio station right after I registered for my classes. And got my dorm room and all that stuff. I uh, met Bill Bliley and um, said, hey, I want to come work with you guys. Mm-hmm. And I guess the rest is history. <laughs> well, that's the history I want to get into with you today. What stuff did you do with the radio station? What was your involvement once you met Bill and, and got there? When I first got there, um, I, I just did uh, an air shift. Mm-hmm. I wasn't you know, in management or anything like that. But I told Bill I was interested in helping him run the radio station and he was more than willing to teach me everything he could. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, did my air shift on a regular basis. I was there whenever I didn't have any classes to do anything, just hanging out in the building, uh, just getting to know everybody on staff and trying to absorb as much as I could as far as knowledge. Yeah. And I learned everything uh, at the radio <laughs> station. I learned everything from where the transmitter was located to, you know, how to deal with any technical issues at the studio if I had to change a needle on the turntable, because we were still spinning 45s, by the way, at the time. So, yep. And uh, we had cart machines for the commercials. And we actually were a commercial station at the time. Right. We had, you know, maybe three or four clients. That was about it. But it was still a functioning, competitive radio station in my mind against uh, WOLF and WNDR, which were the big top 40 stations at the time uh, in, uh, in Syracuse. Now, when I got to the station, I believe the program director was Brian Miller. 
Uh, that's not his real last name, but that was his on-air name. Never is. He was a huge fan of WCFL at the time, which was WLS's major competitor in Chicago. And I used to listen to CFL a little bit on the sideway, but I could pick it up. Mm-hmm. And it was a better radio station than LS, but it wasn't <laughs> nearly as successful. So Brian actually formatted the radio station after WCFL. That was the original format. The station was modeled after CFL as a top 40 station in its early days. And I, and I, don't, I don't think it really ever drifted much from that. Very scary moment for us at WJTZ <laughs> because CFL, as I mentioned, was struggling in the ratings against WLS and decided that they would be so because I think CFL stood for Chicago Federation of Labor. Okay, And I don't know if they still own the station at the time, but the station was sold to a Christian broadcasting group, which, of course, decided they were going to change the format. So, of course, for weeks, we were all nervous that WGPZ was going to end up switching to a Christian format (laughs) because Brian was such a big fan of CFL itself. Uh, Of course, that never happened. Uh, and we survived and, uh, and went on in the rest of history for the station. <laughs> so this is 1200 on the AM dial. That's correct. We've talked to Bill Bliley and Greg Hernandez in the podcast. Talked to your classmate, Mitch Ryder from 79, who talked about once you got into the leadership role, Mitch said you quickly recruited him and empowered him. And this is kind of the tradition that's carried on for 50 years of the radio station is once you sort of ascended the ranks and saying, hey, you know, you can do this. We want you on the team. It seemed like you had those leadership qualities early from what your classmates say. Well, I appreciate them saying that. I don't know if I would agree with that, (laughs) (laughs) but that's kind. You know, I just love radio. Yeah. And I think for me, it was always trying to find other people who also loved radio. Mm -hmm. I think that was the key. And I imagine you worked pretty intently with Rick Wright in those early days, too. Oh, yes. Rick became a friend, of course, uh, after graduation and one of my favorite people uh, from Syracuse. So uh, when I... uh, got inducted in the Hall of Fame for JPZ, and he was there. I was just thrilled to be able to sit at the table with him. We had a great time. I love Rick to death. What other memories and things you remember about your time at Syracuse and at the radio station, Mike? One of the things I think that frustrated me was some people didn't take us very seriously. Mm -hmm. It was funny. We weren't taken as seriously on campus as we were by the industry itself. Okay. People in the market were paying attention to us. <laughs> and then that was more gratifying than anything else. So within just a handful of years, by my sophomore year, I think we had maybe six people on the air working in commercial radio in Syracuse. Wow. That came through WJPZ and AER had none. <laughs> so- <laughs> I'm really glad you got that little swipe in because we love a good <laughs> swipe at WAER. <laughs> So that was my biggest memory was that we just weren't taken seriously on campus by the communications folks. Hmm. Yeah, we were, you know, cranking them out. And, and, and before you knew it, you know, we had some pretty talented people on in the marketplace. That's one memory I, w- I would say I had, you know, as far as just the divide around us. And then people started taking us seriously when they started seeing us and get people hired. Yeah, there you go. That'll, that'll do it, won't it? Yes. Do you remember who some of those people were, that were working the market were and other, and other friends you had in the radio station? Two of the most prominent would probably be Chris Tyler, mm-hmm. whose real name is Chris Tilly. And Chris was uh, hired by uh, WHEN to do uh, nights. And WHEN was one of those, at the time, was an AC station during the daytime that got really young at night. Okay. And so they put Chris on to to go after the young people and the teens. And at that point, the two dominant top 40 stations in Syracuse were were Wolf uh, and WNDR. Mm -hmm. And by the time Chris got there, he actually made WHEN number one in teens. Ah. Much to the frustration, by the way, I should say, of the program director, (laughs) (laughs) WHEN. But HEN also had the best signal at night. So it made sense that, you know, if they were playing the music, that that's where the kids would go. And then there was also Todd Parker, Mm -hmm. who eventually ended up going over to uh, WFBL. And FBL had been this station that was just all over the planet uh, musically over the years. And when they hired Todd, um, Mike Josephs, I don't know, he's a a name in radio history for being one of the architects of Top 40 Radio. Mm -hmm. And they actually literally played the same uh, records every 90 minutes. (laughs) It was the same handful of records. And Todd was all into it. So Todd became a star. And I think eventually became the program director of FBL as well. And they made some noise because they, you know, what we you know, were a two, three share radio station. And when they switched to the top 40 format, they became a six share station. Mm. And they had a better signal than Wolf. So that hurt Wolf as well at the time. So those would be two people 
who, uh, you know, kind of exploded early on in the early years uh, of WJPZ. Any other classmates of yours and names haven't come up already that you've maintained friendships with over the years? Yeah, I mean, I haven't talked to Chris or Todd in a long, long time, but of course, Mitch. Um, uh, there was uh, Rick Wilkinson who ended up going over to ABC. Uh, and now he's an independent videographer who, who does a lot of stuff all around the world. Mm-hmm. Tony Rizzo, who eventually ended up, he was our news director and eventually ended up over at WTVH. Is that Channel 5? Yep. Yeah. Uh, he, he ended up over there in the newsroom there. I want to say he either became news director there or at WHN at some point mm-hmm. uh, before he went to D.C. So th- those are a few of the people that I still know and, and at least we're Facebook friends, even if we don't talk all the time. Gotcha. I want to turn to your career in just a minute, Mike. But before I do that, you talked about that underdog mentality of the radio station where maybe some folks, as you said, to your frustration, didn't take you seriously, but you're getting folks hired in the market. What other lessons from your time at WJPZ do you feel served you well throughout your career and life? Um, learning formatics, certainly um, it's from a career standpoint, learning formatics for radio has served me very well because I've always been accused as, as a broadcaster of taking a lot of top 40 formatics to any radio station I've programmed. Mm-hmm. And most of the stations I programmed were urban. Sure. So they were always tight with, you know, with short playlists and you know, all the stuff that came uh, from Top 40 Radio. Um, but to me, the camaraderie, the teamwork, which is why I'm flattered when people say kind things about me, but I couldn't do things by myself. Sure. And so I kind of grew to expect that kind of loyalty and camaraderie uh, at every radio station I went to. Uh, and I always look for people who were as hungry as I was. Now, it's hard to do, but, you know, it was always important to me to try to have people on my staff that were committed to doing it just the way the folks at JPZ were. And the fact that we were able to stay on the air, I remember the first summer we stayed on the air because usually when classes were out, the station would just sign off for the summer. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, AER doesn't sign off for the summer. <laughs> So we were able to stay on. I think once we stayed on one summer, I don't think the station ever signed off. After. Yeah. But again, it was teamwork and loyalty from uh, student staff. And the technical hurdles that I'm sure you had in those days on what's been described as borrowed Radio Shack turntables and a little transmitter at 1200 a.m. Yeah, we had our challenges. You know, keep in mind, we were an a.m. radio station that was supposed to be 100 milliwatts. Yep. And obviously, 100 milliwatts doesn't get out very far. So uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but we were able to cover the campus uh, in, the, uh, in the early days on the AM dial. And I mean, the back then, you didn't have the kind of interference back then that you do have today for AM radio. Mm. It was still bad. It was rough in some of the dorm rooms. Mm-hmm. You turn on a vacuum and the station would travel. <laughs> you know, there would be all this noise in the background. So we had to deal with that. And then it was the psychological uh, challenges of being on AM. Yeah. Because even though, you know, again, in 75, AM was still a, a major factor in, in the ratings and radio, there was the growth of FM. Right. But at Syracuse, the FM station was automated. So that helped. Mm-hmm. The top 40 FM. So that helped a lot for uh, everybody else to survive in the marketplace on AM. But, you know, you had students who just didn't think it was cool to listen to an AM station. So... That was starting to happen as well at the time. But I think we were able to persevere because I think we were running a quality radio station and we were putting people uh, in the marketplace. It's funny how things come full circle 50 years later. If I'm following what you're saying, you're saying that automated radio doesn't do as well as radio that has personality between the records. Hmm. That's Yeah. <laughs> there was no such thing as voice tracking back then either. So now they're not kind of faking with the automation. Exactly. Exactly. Looking back at half a century of broadcast excellence. This is WJPZ at 50. Hello there, fellow JPZ. This is Sam Kandel, class of 2018. And if you're hearing this and you've got a ticket to this year's banquet, give yourself a pat on the back. If not, well, what are you waiting for? Banquet 39 Spectrum of Studios will be on March 2nd. And you can still get your tickets now at the link in our show notes. Hope to see you there. It's the podcast celebrating the world's greatest media classroom. It's WJPZ at 50. So let's turn to your career now, Mike. You've had this amazing run down in Atlanta. Take me through your journey since graduating Syracuse. Uh, Well, from Syracuse, I ended up working uh, for WHEN. And then I actually worked at WNDR for about three weeks, (laughs) uh, but I couldn't take the moat, you know, going across the moat to get to the studio. <laughs> and nor could I take uh, Randy, who had a habit of running around in the studio. Randy was a mouse. 
Oh, yeah. So I just didn't last that very long over there because there were those kind of issues. So I went to HCN and then do you remember disco? <laughs> Frank and Beverly Harms owned WSOQ at the time, which was an AM station that daytimer that nobody listened. OK. And they decided to put disco on it. <laughs> and I wanted to be a part of it. So I left WACN to go help them do disco radio for about a year and a half, two years before Steve Dahl blew up all the records in Chicago and ended, ended the format. I was going to say that was right around the time that disco ended. OK, yep. Yeah, yeah, it was close to we were we were late comers to that whole <laughs> ball. Uh, so I did that. And then Reagan Henry was a visiting professor at Syracuse. Uh, was close to Rick, and he needed some staff. Uh, he, he wanted to bring in some young students to run some of his radio stations. And he had stations in Cincinnati, Atlanta, and I can't remember what other market. I want to say Baltimore. Mm-hmm. So I got hired to go to Cincinnati and spent a couple of years there and then came to, uh, he was still around, but I didn't come work directly for him at the time in Atlanta. I found out about another AM station. I don't know what it was with me and AM radio stations back then, <laughs> but I had this thing about going to AM stations that were not doing very well <laughs> and having some success. I mean, SOQ, we went from like, you know, a 0.5 to a three share. What's WIGO? Uh, that station had not seen anything higher than a 0.4. Uh, we took it up to like the mid threes within two years. But again, it was all about, you know, applying those top 40 formatics. And playing the hits. So did that and then eventually ended up at the big uh, FM in Atlanta, uh, V103, and stayed there for 12 years as, as the morning man and also as program director for several years. It's funny to think how your roots at WJPZ, where you talk about going to an AM radio station that was struggling and making that thing sing. And then also, yeah. it's come up in the history of JPZ, the idea of making JPZ a top 40 station, the theory being that if you can handle the top 40 format, you can take that with you, to your point, Mike, to run any other format. I've always believed that. I, I, I tell people to this day, one of the reasons Top 40 is, it still remains my favorite format is that if you can do Top 40, you can do any other format. You really can. You can always bring it down. It's hard to, to go from a progressive rock space station and try to do Top 40, but you can always start at Top 40 and, and then, you know, change your approach, do country radio, do an album, you know, orient station or yeah. whatever. You can definitely do the other formats. And urban radio, for example, which I think, you know, I couldn't approve, you can do urban radio as well. So what year did you get to V103? Uh, oh God. Was it 86? I was talking to your LinkedIn earlier. Yeah, it was, yeah, probably. I stayed in V for 12 years. I left in 98. So yeah, do the math. All right, there we go. 86. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I did that. And then before I got the bug, I wanted to be a, a radio station owner, which is, you know, currently what I did. Yeah, I left in 98, bought my radio station during my last year at V. Okay. So I did both for a year. And then decided to retire and then devote full time to my own thing. So before we come back to your owning radio stations, you talked about these underdog AM stations. You go to V103 in Atlanta, which is just a legendary radio station in the industry. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about your time as Morning Man program director at that top dog radio station. It was fun. Um, Probably some of the most fun years I've had in broadcasting. You know, V has always been an institution in the market. And at that time, it was still, you know, one of the top ranked radio stations in the market. But we always kind of fought against ourselves. Okay, it wasn't really about competing against everybody else because we were, you know, we're going to be number one. It was can we do better than the last book? You know, that was the whole premise behind the station. But I did the morning show. Back then, a lot of urban FM stations were really more about music than anything else. Mm -hmm. And we really kind of focused uh, our morning show as a personality driven show. You know, eventually we got to the point where there would be, you know, hours and days where there was no music at all in the morning. If, if everything we were doing and talking about was compelling enough. Yep. So we were, you know, early in doing that, you know, in urban radio, which now it's, you know, pretty common now that the personalities, especially the syndicated shows, you know, the personalities are more dominant than music in the morning. So I think we kind of developed that. We were uh, one of the first urban stations to do a major cash prize giveaway on the air. Really? I remember us shutting down the AT&T phone lines in downtown Atlanta, (laughs) uh, which uh, did not go over very well with the hospital downtown. Oh, jeez. And we were asked to never, ever do that again. (laughs) Problems of being too successful, a radio station. 
yeah, and keep in mind there were no cell phones back then. So everything was landlocked and the landlines could only hold, you know, handle so much. Mm-hmm. And we were very community driven as far as the stuff we did in the community. I remember one of the highlights of the radio station in one of its highest rated periods was during the uh, Rodney King uprising yeah. uh, in LA. And we stopped the music and for eight hours, we became a talk station with, you know, Maynard Jackson and key political leaders uh, coming on the air to keep the city calm. And the city at the time, uh, city government credited our station for keeping Atlanta from exploding. Wow. Uh, at that time. Ironically, if you do the right thing, it pays off. The station had a 13 share, I believe, 13 or 14 share that. Wow. It's never been higher rated than that. It, I think uh, the number two station in the market was had half the numbers. Yeah. It was an incredible period, but more importantly, it was a period where we proved the power of radio and serving community. And it was also one of these urban stations that had a full staff news department as well. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting experience and and a fun experience and an impactful experience for me, you know, in my broadcast career. When you have a dominant station like that in the market and you can serve your audience and have that kind of power, that's really incredible. I worked briefly in New Orleans, uh, Q93 had a, a little bit yes. of a, a, sim, a similar uh, feel to that when I was at iHeart and they were in our building. What you can do with that radio station, like you said, the power of radio, I can see from Syracuse, Rick Wright is uh, nodding as he's listening to you speak right now, Mike. <laughs> so if my math is right, if you were at V103 till 98, would that have been around that time that that booming hip hop scene in Atlanta was coming up with Ludacris and Usher and all those folks? Yeah, in fact, I would have left right before it really, really exploded. In fact, to be honest with you, uh, John, that was one of the reasons why I left. Really? Yeah, because I want not only did I want to do my own thing, by then I think I was around 40 years old Mm -hmm. or getting close to 40 if I hadn't turned 40 quite yet. And, you know, I was aging out of of where radio was going musically. Okay. So I said, you know, it would be better to let somebody younger come in. And then Frank Ski came in and replaced me at V. And then I went to Macon and put on my own hip hop radio station. (laughs) Well, but I didn't have to be on the air. So I could tolerate it that way. But yeah, that certainly was the time when uh, hip hop was really exploding. Then the competitive situation was changing in Atlanta because that was also the time about a year or two before I left, V got a full hip hop competitor. Okay. And V again was one of those urban stations that for decades had been all things to all people. Mm -hmm. But by the time the hip hop station came on and urban AC station had come on going after our older end. So it became a bit of a, a challenge for me to become this very broad radio station. Understood. So was station ownership something that was always on your mind or was it something you kind of really started thinking about in that time as you were winding down at V in the 90s? No, it was always on my mind. Okay. The fact that V103 was one of the first urban stations in the country that was billing over a million dollars a month. Mm. I said, you know, geez, <laughs> <laughs> if I can help make this kind of money for the radio station, why don't I just do it myself? I gotcha. Little did I know that I really don't like sales. <laughs> so that was a struggle for me early on, you know, trying to get my head, wrap my head around the whole sales side. Now that's, you know, my primary focus. But back then, you know, I just wanted to program the best radio station I could, wanted to own it and figured I could hire some people uh, to sell it for me and we'd make a lot of money. Um, that part really never happened. They <laughs> wait, so got great ratings. <laughs> But never, never got rich off of it. So I always liked working for GMs and owners that came up through the programming side because I felt like I could relate to them better. But you make a good point there about the programming versus sales. During my last year or so there at V, I I bought four radio stations, uh, underperforming stations, all licensed to the suburban areas of Macon. Um, So, you know, we were trying to serve Macon with uh, some some signal challenges with a couple of the signals. We had two AMs and two FMs. Okay. The station I had with the best signal was the one we turned to hip hop and it covered uh, the Macon market pretty well and uh, it was the flagship. So I did that for a number of years until the economy kind of got rough mm-hmm. and I decided to sell it and uh, yeah. use the money from that to pay off the, the station I still own. So what's the station that you own now, Mike? I own WQMJ. It's a Magic 100. It's an R&B oldie station. And uh, it's a little older than most R&B oldie stations because uh, Macon's a very crowded market. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to kind of create a niche for the station. And uh, we have a couple signal issues in the downtown area of Macon, but most of the market be covered with no problem. So we just kind of focus on our own niche. And we've got a pretty loyal audience as a result of that. Been running that one by itself for the last 
Oh, she's 10, 12 years. Uh, Cause I sold the, the hip hop station about 10, 12 years ago. What does your typical day look like now? I don't know what two days are like, but can you give me an idea of what your day looks like nowadays? Well, I'm at home right now. I work from home on Tuesdays and Thursdays until around uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. Then I, you know, get myself together and head down to Macon. And then I'm at the radio station on those two days, uh, no later than four. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I do when I get on the station is uh, work on the newscast for six o'clock. Uh, we do um, two and a half, three minute news updates uh, five times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all pre recorded. Um, so this morning's newscast, for example, was recorded last night. Got it. And uh, we're the only station in the market of any format that does its own local news. Wow. Yeah. Everybody else uses a television station to um, do news if they do news at all. We produce our own newscast. It's a combination of both uh, local and national. That's what I normally do on those two days. And the other days of the week, I'm there and I get up and I head into the station by 8, 8.15, 8.30 and update the uh, newscast for the nine o'clock uh, hour. Uh, that's the first thing I do. And then it's, you know, by scheduling music, you know, dealing with clients and visiting some clients. I spend a lot of time collecting money from clients. That's not bad. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of time. <laughs> <collecting money. laughs> you know, it's a lot of time collecting money. So I'm constantly running around the market. Uh, like Monday, I was running around the town, you know, uh, collecting money from uh, several different clients. And most of our clients are local. Uh, we do have a national rep, uh, but most of our clients are local and, and a couple of regional clients as well. And your air staff, local, national combination? I don't have an air staff. I had an air staff when I had the hip hop station. Uh, my only station is automated, mm -hmm. uh, so there is no air staff. But the music is, is all programmed locally, and we do, like I said, we do a lot of news coverage on the station, public service stuff. That's you know kind of about it. It's primarily sixty, late sixties, seventies, and early to mid eighties R and B oldies. So you know, lots of Michael Jackson, lots of Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Temptation, stuff like that. Well, I'm up here in Motown, so I can certainly appreciate that. <laughs> you can appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I was going to ask, as you were taking me through this, if you missed being on the air, but it sounds like you're getting the best of both worlds because you're owning the radio station, you're doing the newscast, you're on the air, you're scheduling the music. I mean, it sounds like you've got the perfect gig. Yeah, I don't miss necessarily being on the air on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, doing a music show mm -hmm. or, you know, being the DJ, for example. I miss the people who were always very kind, right? Uh, the listeners. But in today's world of social media, I don't know if I'd handle that. Very <laughs> now that's part of the requirement. You can't just be an on-air personality. Right. You have to have a, a heavy social media presence. And I think the last time I updated my Facebook page was in 2020, something like that. Ah, the before times. Yeah. So the social media part would drive me nuts. Understood. Yeah. Well, your team, you have to ask you something that I ask all of our guests that still work in the industry. What is your perspective on where radio is at now and the challenges that it faces and what it has to do to stay relevant? Well, the typical answer for relevancy for radio is to stay local. Yeah. You know, that's always our ace in the hole when it comes to everything else we're competing against. You know, I'm not a big fan of national voice track shows. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, frankly, you know, you might as well automate the thing, if, you know, with no jocks, if that's what you're going to do. But I still believe in an air talent that's locally based. But in smaller markets, that's becoming, you know, the rarity. Mm -hmm. You know, in a typical radio station in a market like Macon, just about every morning show, not all of them, but just about every morning show is, is some sort of a syndicated show. And there might be one local talent who's either doing middays or afternoons. And then the rest of the time, the station's automated. Right. I think for me, watching major markets like Atlanta, uh, move away from 24-7 live local talent, which V103 still does. Mm -hmm. But most of the stations, even in Atlanta, uh, especially at 10 o'clock at night, there's like nobody there on the air. Right. You know, with the exception of a handful of stations. It's automated. And, and, and I think that it hurts us competitively when it comes to survival. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand the reasons behind it being a station owner. You know, you're trying to watch your costs and all that stuff. And the pandemic certainly um, created its own set of problems for revenue for radio stations. I mean, I talked to stations that, you know, I was complaining that our revenue was down 35 percent during the height of the pandemic. Oof. And I talked to stations where their revenue was down 70 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Doing that. Um, so that did not help matters because that forced a lot of stations to move their talent to either, you know, voice tracking or they were broadcasting from home. Uh, or just to switch to automation. And in some cases, those that switch to automation in certain day products never came back. Yeah. And we're still trying to grow revenue 
back to where it was. I think it's close. Mm-hmm. I think a couple of political cycles certainly help. Yes. In that regard. But I think we've got to stay local. We've got to stay relevant and we've got to stay connected to our communities. And we've got to be the place where people come to find out what's going on around the corner. If we don't do that, then, you know, we're going to be in the same position as newspapers. Right. You know, if we're not careful. But I will say right now, the last survey I show, saw showed that 91 percent of Americans still listen to commercial radio every day. There you go. So we're still doing well. Before we wrap up, Mike, I do want to bring it back around to WJPZ. I'm curious for your perspective on the radio station. You know, you came to Syracuse for your Hall of Fame induction. You were doing this thing when it was on the AM dial in the late 70s. Here we are now, 2023, as we record this. And the station has survived for 50 plus years now. I'm curious for your perspective on how it's done and how it survived and what you've seen. Well, I, I think certainly moving the FM band played a huge role in that survival. Yeah. Which was probably in a, inevitable as well. Oh. Wasn't that like an, a, a class project or something like that? We've got episodes with a whole bunch of the class of 84, 85, 86 that were real big parts of that, getting it moved over. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of that, that, that they went through the whole process of applying for a license. So that was a learning, learning experience in itself. Other than switching to FM, I'm, I'm not surprised by the survival of the radio station, only because it always had a mission. Um, this being, you know, the greatest classroom in the world mm-hmm. for, for broadcasting for radio. I think that mindset from the early days has certainly, you know, given the station the opportunity to flourish over the years. And more importantly, you know, you talk about 50 years for JPC. We're talking basically 50 years with the same basic format. Yeah. And that in itself is amazing. You know, I mean, the station certainly went to its periods where it would lean more rock or lean more urban, you know, or dance or or, or whatever. But it's always been a top 40 radio station. True. What do they call it now? Uh, 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 contemporary uh, hits radio? Yes, yeah, CHR. Yep. Yes. But it's always been that kind of a radio station that sought to stick to a mission of consistency in a format, again, that would lend itself to teaching everybody the basics where they could survive in any format. So to survive 50 years, I think sticking to the initial goals probably is what has contributed to that greatly. Excellent. Mike Roberts, before I let you go, any stories you care to share with the audience? Funny things that happened back in the day? I remember one of my early days on the air, one of the announcers who will remain nameless, (laughs) um, taught me a good lesson about how radio pranks are always going to be part of what you deal with. I'm on the air live and and the mic's open and I'm talking. And he was the program director at the time. He walks in the studio and drops his pants <laughs> right while I'm on the air live, butt naked from the waist down. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out how do I handle this on the air? And I think I just started busting out laughing. And to this day, I don't think anybody understands why I was laughing. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that funny moment for me personally, but it also said to me, OK, you're going to have to deal with this as the years go by. You know, radio people are crazy. <laughs> uh, learned that uh, not the wild story, but it was one of the things that kind of cracked me up. An example of the world's greatest media classroom. That's probably a first for the hundred or so episodes we've done on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Roberts, class of 1979, Hall of Famer and just legend in Atlanta and in the urban radio community. I can't thank you enough for coming on and being part of this podcast. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. The WJPZ at 50 podcast is created entirely by the staff and alumni of the world's greatest media classroom. It's hosted by John Jag Gay, class of 2002. Editing help from James Bames Grundy III, class of 2020. Imaging by Maureen Cooper, class of 1999. And Ed Lacombe, class of 1985. Podcast artwork by Marty Dundix, class of 2001. Follow WJPZ at 50 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.